different colorful works um, by my uncle, by my aunt, by my great uncle, by my cousins, by my brother, and by my mom. Um, also a shout out to my cousins <laughs> and my uncle. Um, so the, the contraption to put all the stuff in the boxes, my uncle so for the, for the technical department, <laughs> he's the genius. <laughs> um, and so the question was as well, like, okay, so if I'm going to come here in the Van Alba um, to present something, what could I present? What could we present? What are the questions that we're working with? Now, as you can see from my shirt, I'm from Curacao. <laughs> Here's how answer Martin, but we'll get to that in a second. So, then the question was, okay, so, um, 2019, what's the significance of that year? We're in 2020 now, but 2019 was the 50 years since the uprising on Curacao on the 30th of May, 1969. Now, I've done a couple of works before looking at the 30th of May, um, and always I'm, I'm telling a story that my mom once told me. And so, at a certain point I was like, hmm, it doesn't feel right for me to be telling the story. I think it's best if she tells it herself. So. <laughs> <laughs> it was a normal day, 30th of May, 1969. In a humble family, father, mother, 11 children, 5 girls, 6 boys. Four of my eldest brothers and sisters were working, and seven were still going to school. This was our house. It started very small. Can you see it? Because my father was a carpenter, and as the family was growing, he continued building until it became this big. My mother was a stay-at-home mom, but came, come in, this is the rest of the family. Yeah. <laughs> my son, my stepdaughter, my daughter-in-law, and my grandchildren. <laughs> so, um, since my mother was a stay-at-home mom and came from a farmer family, my father uh, helped her to still get something to do home. So, he did um, with milk and my mother was very good in cultivating fruit vegetables and plants and my father was working by shell. This is shell. But not as not in the oil but as a carpenter. My father was a fine carpenter and was working for the recreation center from Shell. Okay, so <clears throat> I think it's important to know when Shell came on the island was 1914, 1915, and he came to the island because they found oil at Lake Maracaibo in Venezuela in 1904. Important to remember, right? Maracaibo, Venezuela, Shell, Curacao. 
Now, in the 1950s on Aruba, we get the Lago refinery, but that's late. Now we're talking about Shell. Yeah. And so the interesting thing about Shell as well is, hey, I'm calling you to come in. <laughs> and, so the, and so the interesting thing about, about Shell as well is thinking to the way how this huge transnational Dutch-British company comes to an island which is kind of impoverished uh, towards the end of the 19th century because the ending of slavery meant the ending of plantations, which is interesting, right? So what does that do? That creates poverty. Now, Shell comes, and Shell rearranges the whole social construct of the island. Economic construct, cultural construct, everything changes. Everything goes towards facilitating this company. Also, education. But we'll get to that in a second. Yes. So that particular morning, my sis, two sisters and two brothers went to work. My father went to work. And seven of us were still going to school. I was the eldest one. So my mother always was a very organized mom. And we know from the night before that the next day she was going to town to pay our light bill. Because that was the only bill that we had to pay. Because since she cultivated all this, we don't have to worry about a lot of groceries and stuff. So my brother, the one for the last one, was sick and my mother decided to go with him to town that particular morning, not knowing that something was going on here. This is What's right? post fact. And so, post five is interesting because the evening before, there were negotiations going on between the various unions and between the subcontractor of Shell called Rescar. Now, Rescar was trying to sell the workers short. I mean, we've all heard of the um, flex work contracts and the zero hour contracts at the moment here in Europe. But in the 1960s, this was going on as well in the former colonies, right? So one of the things that I find interesting sometimes is these conversations about how you fight capitalism, we miss that link. A lot of the things that were done before, or a lot of things that are happening now, have been done before. And so they're fighting this contract because what they realize is that the local black workers, laborers, technicians, engineers, refinery people, people working at the various stations, people driving, people who went to study in the Netherlands, people who got a scholarship by Shell to study here and to go back to work at Shell were being paid one third of the amount of the Dutch white workers who were being flown in from the Netherlands. Now, they're being flown in, they get more money, and they also get their own villages. Yes. So this, that particular morning, they, there was about 100 workers that decided the night before that they had a meeting that they are going to the government building to fight their wages. But then, Papa Godet came, the leader from the Harvey workers, and said, no, we all are going. So it became about 3,000 workers decided to go to the government building in town. And so they're doing this, and as they're doing it, they're also talking about recognition, right? Pong is a conocimiento, right? They're saying that they need to be respected. They need to be understood in a way in which that wasn't being done before. Like, how exactly can you be working on your own island, the soil where, you know, your navel has been buried, the soil where the umbilical cord has been buried, the soil where you come from, and you're being regarded as less than. Right? And so, the thing is, 
as they're fighting, and it becomes more than just about a contract. It becomes about the fact that there are villages on the island called Yulianador and Amistad. These were villages that we, as people from Curaçao, could not go to. It was really there for the Dutch people that were working for the Shell Company. Any answer? And Henderson was their supermarket where they alone was allowed to go, not we. So these people, the angry people that started by first five. The, the righteously angry people? <laughs> 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 they start walking, walking, going. So, but before they reached Henderson, they met a Portuguese in his. Then uh, the Portuguese were coming to our island. They started by selling ice cream, and then when they built up an amount of money, they was the first one to start with the supermarket. Thus, they find the truck here, so take him out, took all the ice cream, and burned down his truck. So. People start getting frightened. They continue walking and coming to the supermarket. This story I know very well because my two neighbors were working in there. They went inside the chain. In those days, they had no gun, but with sticks and, and um, machete. Come into the supermarket, throw everything down, and there is where they, I can say, stole of steel, where they took the alcohol. I mean, I mean, it's that's one of the stories. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the interesting thing to remember about this is not just the connection between the Portuguese at that moment in time, but also the historic connection, right? Because before the Dutch were on Curacao, they were in Brazil. I mean, we all know the story about Maurits, right? Prince Maurits. Um, no. Yeah? yeah. Okay, if you don't, there's someone next to you who's nodding yes, they can tell you afterwards. <laughs> and so the interesting thing about that is, um, Maurits had created a system in Brazil where all of these different, various people lived and worked together. I mean, we've all heard the stories as well of like a tolerant, Dutch nation, where all of the Huguenots could come from France after being persecuted, the Sephardic Jews came here, then they went to the colonies. They went to Curaçao, they went to Brazil, they went to Aruba, all over the place. They went to Syria. And so the interesting thing as well, and I keep saying interesting because I find it all interesting, <laughs> is this notion of who gets to build upon the past, and who doesn't? So on the location where Shell Refinery is now placed, that is in Anabai, that used to be a place called Asiento. And the Asiento was a rule in which the Spanish crown had determined how many African slaves, African enslaved, abducted, kidnapped people could be traded at one time or another. And you had these different trading posts. So when Shell came in 1914 to the island, what they did is they sought out this place which has a naturally deep, deep corridor for ships to come in. And so there is where they placed this auction market. There is where the refinery is now placed upon. And so when sometimes people think about how can we not remember the past, it's about the erasure of that past and who gets to build upon that erasure or not. In the meanwhile, my father got to know that this is going on. So because my mom went to town to pay this light bill, he now rushed to come home. But I have to tell this little story because my father used to work for the Shell not in the oil, because he was a fine carpenter. And Shell decided 
make a law that 55 years you are going to lay off people. So my father was 55 years old, seven children still go in school, and they did offer him a job in the recreation center, but for the workers. So he had to take it because he cannot depend on my two brothers and sisters that are working. It's his responsibility. So he was working at the recreation center for us, for the workers, but not, that was not his cup of tea because that is what, not what he had wanted to do. There he was only building chairs and table while at the recreation center in Shell, he was really, really more creative, building the stages, decorating, but he took the job. So he rushed, and it is funny to know that my father was riding a bike all his life. So he rushed from home to receive us. It has to come from far because he knows that my mother is in town. Like, oh, you hear me? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> for the recording, it's for the recording. But the recording is still have to do it. Yeah. Okay. Maybe you can help him. See, then, and I'll, it's a little... I'll, I'll jump in. This is Ron. <laughs> Give a round of applause to Ron. <laughs> and so this idea of education is important. I alluded to it earlier, right? So this is the... Uh, Peter Stuyvesant College. Yes. I did not get through to get no one from this school to interview them because I can imagine if you see a bunch of people, angry people, coming across the road in front of your school, it got to be scary. But and then, but also, I mean, exciting, right? Exciting. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're seeing all these people rush, you're seeing all these people finally stand up against what the injustice is that you see, and you're like, okay, let's pull this off, let's go again, let's, let's, let's do something. And when I say go again, I'm referring to Tula. How, how many have heard of Tula? Explain here, who was Tula? <laughs> I think Tula is our most, our, as in the island, Curacao's most known um, revolutionary or uh, freedom fighter who during the, the period of slavery on Curacao was one of the first people to gather a group of men and women to revolt against these different uh, invaders. And uh, even though they were trying to be hushed by the church, who was converting them in mass to Christianity, they still revolted. Because the priests were like, no, you need to uh, respect these people who are trying to make you uh, civilized, these people who are trying to show you a different way of life, who are trying to educate you. They were like, we don't need no education. There's a, there's a very famous letter from a woman who was part of the revolt who wrote back to this priest telling him, well, if this is what you believe to be civilized when they treat us like animals, you can join them and let us have our freedom. So Tula is the man who they executed afterwards because even though the revolt was successful, it was successful as a message for that time. 1795, right? And this is amazing because when you think of the Haitian Revolution, yeah. you think of it as something that's being isolated. But it wasn't. It was being shared around, inspiring all these different types of uprisings all throughout the Caribbean. And so when I say again, I'm talking about this continued emphasis on resistance to the status quo of oppression. So when these students in this Peter Stuyvesant Collegium, <laughs> And they, it's not named after Peter Stuyvesant no more. Not anymore. Because people realize that Peter Stuyvesant was not such a good man. <laughs> <laughs> to, to say it euphemistically. So they took down his um, statue, statue and gave the, the school another name. So in the meanwhile, the father came home because three, four, the four youngest one, three boys and my youngest sister, was going to school 
not far from us. And I had another brother, the, the, the one that was working as a carpenter. He was working all close by. So they reached home. And my father still waiting on my sister Gala, my two sisters, the nurses, my brother, eldest brother, and I. Still waiting on five children. In the meanwhile, they passed. Harrison uh, and uh, uh, in, in front of Pekusayi's son, Kaleisha was also a superman from a Portuguese. This one don't reach his goal. And they went inside there too. And this man begged them, please take all what you want, but don't go down my place. So they get alcohol again and continue. Walking, walking, going, new house. And here you get Texas Instrument, that was an American company where gave a lot of women because in those days when women in Curacao were still stay home mom, but due to this Texas Instrument, Women then get out of the house and start working there for less money. But still, they was very proud to get a job. It was a transistor, kind of transistor company. Mm -hmm. So f five years after the uprising, they left the island. Yes. Yeah. We went inside. We got nothing to pay. But still, they break down the place because it was still a little angry about. This place. And also because, I mean, that then is me imagining all these different historical connections, but I mean, give me that. <laughs> so I'm thinking, in 1940s, during the Second World War, the US pretty much occupied Curacao. 80% um, of the gasoline and benzene that was being used by the Allied forces came from Shell and Curacao. And so to make sure that the German U-boats, German um, deep sea divers would not jeopardize that, they instituted a lockdown, curfews on the island. Um, I mean, even, even my, my grandma, my mother's mom, used to tell the stories of her being taken by the US soldiers on flights. She used to work at a, at a, a laundry, it's in a high position, and she, she could speak Dutch and English because the laundry was only for soldiers on Curacao in those days. And so I think one of them must have been flirting with her. Because <laughs> the story she tells us is that it took her up in a plane and gave her a flight to see the island from above. We, um, some of my aunts and uncles question that. Mm -hmm. I <laughs> want to believe it. I believe it, but my very yeah, the most of the family don't believe it, but she told us that she went in the first plane that came to Curacao. But in those days, there was no camera to take pictures, so we <laughs> got approved. I believe her. Yeah, it's, it's her memory, right? <laughs> so, while my father is waiting home, I am in school, and I am in school right in town. And my sister Gala is in school in Utrabanda. These people walking along, let me go, and they reach here, in this Curacao Drive to Ride Dog. <laughs> And there is where my brother was working. My brother was working there by the Curacao Dock Company. So when they reach here, the shooting starts and they kill two people and also they shot the leader of the Harbor Union, Papa Godet. So they had to rush him to the hospital 
And that is how my two sisters that are nurses in hospital got to know that something is going on. <coughs> so the one was working for the men department, the other one, children department. So they reach at the hospital, my sister run, the oldest one, to the one that's working at the children department to tell her that they can get a ride with another nurse that living in the neighborhood. So come on, get out of here. I am in school, not knowing anything, but in the meantime, when they shooting started, these people get more and angry, so they put barricades so that they can't go to town, but they cross over, and before you know, they were in town. This is Hans Tyler, <laughs> and this is Utrabana. And my school was more or less here, so. so <clears throat> We did not get to know until these people don't reach here. Because they have to, those days they had no mobile phone, it's only the office, they got one phone. So they called the director to tell them, but by the time we got to know, they start breaking down tongue. And, 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 and specific story. So I was going to school with my neighbor, me and Gala, my sister, and the daughter was going to school in the same school with me. So first thing I thought, I got to reach that hill because if I had a gas bomb, I'd pick her up. So I ran around, I found her, and this is the bridge. The, the um, Queen Emma book. So I got her and the run. Get out there, but they start breaking down the place already. And I remember a jewel store, Spitz from Fulman, they break it down. Cold and chain and everything falling down, and they tell us to pay, pay. I said, no, not me. I want to reach home. By that time, they didn't start learning as yet. But you saw these ladies, because what I'm going to say here is very serious. There was places here in town, like jewel store and perfume store, that I wouldn't work because of my color. It was only light-skinned girls, beautiful hair. Even though I had more education with them, they are not taking me in the shop. Thus, so you understand that these people not only for shell, when they reach there too, they burn down those stores too. Because who knows that they have no sister aunt that never could work, you know? That would like to work in such a store, but would not get in. So I run and my neighbor was that was parking right here in Punda. I don't know how he get there, but we jump into the car, now I want to go and check my sister because she's in school in Notre Dame. In the meanwhile, my mother saw this mass people because she was here in Notre Dame. She gets frightened and wants to get into the bus, but he had my little brother with her. And she says she don't care what, where the bus is going now, she just jump into a bus. But the driver did not know that she was with my brother. So when my, my mother got into the car, two cars killed my brothers. <coughs> I was put in between two cars. My, brother dra my mother dragged him and he got into the bus. But when the bus that my mother got in, remember with my brother, with with me hurt, had to walk, walk about two to three kilometers before she reached home because it was a wrong bus. She just had wanted to get out of town. And my father is getting anxious here to see when she's coming home. And meanwhile, yes. Well, one of the interesting things about this track 
from one side of the um, capital city to the other side, because there's, there's this bridge separating them, right? But there are also ferries that can carry you over. So sometimes the bridge is open, sometimes it's closed. Now one of the things that we, in conversation, we're speculating about is like, how come they did not close the bridge? The bridge? Why was it left open? Yeah, because these people, they crossed the bridge. They crossed the bridge. So my mother then run the other bus to go home. My, my driver, my neighbor, passed over this bridge to come to Otrabada because I want to know what about my sister, Gala, that is in school in Otrabada. When we reached the school, Gala wasn't there. I, the school was closed. Yeah. No Gala to find. But maybe because you've heard the story. Maybe it's over <laughs> time. And Gala is their mother. <laughs> <laughs> Can you hear that story? It's a bits and pieces. <laughs> Tell the bits and pieces. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you can be honest with someone. I really don't know that much. Well, one of the things that, because we've, we've done this performance on my mom's birthday, Curacao, last year as well. And we did it um, also at the home of my mom, Gala. So she's the one who made the dolls in the exhibition. <laughs> and so she said that she just jumped on someone's seat in the car and did not care where they were going, who they were. She was like, I recognize one person in the car, I'm going with you. And that's what she got caught. Yes. So, I panicked because my sister in that the school is closed. So, yes, my, my neighbor decided, let's go home, you know, we might find a home. When we reached home, I was so lucky to see her that she was home. And in the meantime, my two sisters, the nurses, got home too. My mother came later walking with, his, with my little brother, but everything went still okay. It was not such a big deal. Now, these people, they went in Puna, burned down all of these stores, crossed the bridge, they did not burn Handel's car. Those stores, you know, that if you stay in Otrabada, you can see all those lights. So they did not burn them, but they burned the stores behind, in between. But Otrabada, they were all of them. And they could. What's, what's interesting to know, I, I keep interrupting. So, what's okay. interesting to know as well about those buildings is that the bricks that was used for those buildings were ballast in the ships during colonial times. So the actual bricks of these buildings that look as if they could come from Amsterdam are literally from here. All right? And so there's, there's, there's this weird architectural <laughs> migration going on, which I think also needs to be understood and talked about, also in terms of understanding the Amsterdam architecture the little houses below, below street level for the workers, for the servants. The fort in um, Ghana, Fort Almina, you have the, the holes, you have the cells of the enslaved Africans, and above it was a church. So um, when I reached home and found my sister, the only one who still was missing was my brother that told him by the top. That's the way. So my father standing outside waiting, you know, he had a car if I was starting to start working. But he, he was not coming home. So I, I we heard, you know, a little discussion with my mother and my father about, yeah, I think he went with them. My mother said, no, I know him, he did not go. So still waiting on my brother to come, to come home. And then, all of a sudden, my father saw his car coming. He, glad, 
with the cradle whiskey coming inside with the cradle whiskey on the shoulder. My father said, not inside here. No police is coming to my house for a cradle whiskey. And that is how the story ended. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Yeah.